Okay, uh, so now we're going to do State of Grid, and it's a joint collaboration with me and Ms. Poon, who gets to click on that. So, just before we get started, I thought we'd say a few words about this guy, if anyone remembers him. Um, as you know, um, Ignos is Trevor Bolt, or at least the, uh, the person who goes by that, that pseudonym. Um, he's been on from the project for a while now, and I just thought it was appropriate now to say a few words about, about him and his contribution. Um, so, I mean, he, he basically what happened since, since launch, from the community's perspective, it looked like a, a fairly sudden disappearance. But from ours, kind of in the, the core team, we were actually contacted with a few times as he kind of faded away from the project. Now, the reasons he faded away from the project are, are personal. I don't really want to, want to share them. I kind of leave that to him if he wants to or ever wants to come back and give those reasons. I think they were genuine and, and valid. Um, so, uh, really, I mean, obviously it was a bit difficult and the entire team put a lot of, kind of stress on all of us. We went from a project that had a kind of a, a single benevolent leader trying to scramble, and some good things did come out of it in the end. We have the, the council, we have sub teams, kind of have a, a bit more of a decentralized structure than we used to have, and I think it's good. But at the same time, like from a personal perspective, um, like I miss Igno being on the project. Um, he was, he's an expert. I, I don't know, like most of the, the kind of core team have had a chance to work with him or interact with him directly. I mean, I work with him on a fairly daily basis for about two years. And it's kind of hard to describe. Like, when you get to a certain stage in your career, it's, it's really hard to find mentors after a while, but I really feel he was one. And um, I miss him being on the project, not just for the sake of the project, but from a personal perspective as well. I feel I kind of lost a mentor and friend and someone we could talk to. So I thought we'd just take a second to say thanks to Igno for your contribution. He's the reason why we're kind of all here today. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, the last, the last, well not necessarily the last, but one of the last kind of uh, messages I had from him. And that's all he said, and that was directed at all of us and the entire community. Uh, don't worry, keep doing what you're doing. Everyone's doing a great job. And I hope he's well, and yeah, that's, we'll leave it there. Thanks. Great, and I come in for the TLDR part. Uh, <clears throat> So yeah, in case uh, this is your first uh, uh, interaction with Grin, um, Grin uh, wants to be better money. Uh, it aims to be a lightweight implementation of our cryptocurrency that aims to be privacy preserving, scalable, and fair. And uh, we'll come back to this uh, a, bit, a bit later uh, in, in this talk. But first, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, in case some of you uh, might have been aware, there was a um, security researcher that uh, published a report uh, some research they had done on, uh, on GRIN. Uh, in summary, uh, they, ran, um, they ran a node uh, that was honest but curious. So it was connecting to, it was following the protocol, it was connecting to a lot of nodes, uh, and as a result, uh, they were able to see inputs and outputs being linked. And this is a, a limitation of, of, um, of Mimble in general as a protocol. Uh, it's a known limitation. Uh, you can use these inputs and outputs to build a transaction graph. Right? The researcher didn't do that, uh, but they might as well could have. Right? They had a list of, of um, output A spends to output B. Like it's, it's basically a list of uh, uh, output commitments. It's what you see on, on the blockchain as well if you go to, to, um, to a block explorer. Uh, the, the thing is, is uh, you know, in particular, is that you know, if you see unaggregated transactions, you will see which input and output you can expect. Uh, we see very little aggregation today. Uh, and, uh, but, but even if you, even if there was a lot of volume, then some nodes on the network would still be seeing unaggregated transactions. So they would still be seeing uh, inputs and outputs. In there, right? uh, this means that an attacker can just deploy more nodes. And you, know, you don't need to be like a supernova or anything on the network to do this. If you're just an honest node and you deploy lots of them uh, and you just pay attention, uh, then you will be seeing a lot of these uh, uh, transactions pop around. This is a constant high priority for us. It's been so since before we launched. It was already a priority by the time we did GreenCon Zero. Uh, and it's an open research pro problem that uh, I'm sure Quentin is going to talk about, I think, 
I was going to talk a little bit more about it as well. But uh, hmm. Hmm. computer says no. So yeah, but so what does all this mean for, for privacy then, in, in general, right? So first of all, privacy is very hard, it's very complex. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot of layers, right? Uh, grid is one of those layers if you use it, but there's a lot of other layers as well that you might be exposing yourself or leaking your privacy to. I don't mean this in any kind of hand wavy way in saying that, oh, privacy is hard, so therefore it doesn't really matter if grid is not doing it right. That's not really the, what, what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is, even if you had like a perfect privacy coin, which doesn't really exist, you might still be leaking privacy. Now, uh, specifically to grid, uh, we often make this analogy of, of cash when we use grid. It's interactive, you hand over some notes, which is an output commitment. It's, it's an interactive process, you get, you get output commitments back. Uh, it actually works quite well here with, in terms of, with regards to privacy as well. So if you transact with an attacker directly, you are at risk. It's the same thing as if uh, you, know, you would, uh, you, you would um, transact with an undercover cop or something. Right? If you're doing something illegal and, and you're transacting with a, a cop that's undercover, then you're putting yourself at risk. But it takes the cop to be active. You need to do an active transaction with you to get this information. In addition to this, if you want to stay private, don't give your passport to an exchange. Right? Don't give a copy of your passport to an exchange. That leaks privacy. Right? But say you even have done so, and if, if then uh, this attacker is transacting with you, and the attacker is actually working with the exchange, then they can, can co cooperate and reveal your identity. And this analogy is like, think of it as like the, the attacker is sending you marked bills, trace bills or something, right? And, and, uh, and you use those bills and you go to the exchange where you have your KYC identity and you spend them there and the exchange says, hey, no, look, this, is a, this is a marked bill. Uh, and and, and, and that, that is a risk for you. But this, this, is a side, this is a type of side channel attack uh, because side channel is if you have additional data. Here the, KYC, the exchange has your KYC information and they can use this data to, to dox you. Uh, the, these attacks are really powerful. And it's very hard to prevent them in any cryptocurrency. You're leaking in, in, information in all different kinds of ways. And what's really an important takeaway from the last week is that it seems like, uh, first of all, the, the community wasn't as clear about this output input capability that was possible that we had already uh, documented in our privacy primer. Uh, and we need to communicate much clearer about this and all of these limitations. But we, I think, personally, I think we should also communicate more about what it takes to be really private, or what, what, what you can't achieve, or what's really difficult to achieve if you're trying to be really private, so that people are more aware of it. Now, moving forward, uh, what has happened since uh, uh, Zero? Well, well, quite a lot of things, actually. I'm going to go like super high level here. So on the development side, we launched, which will be a huge thing, right? Uh, and, and not only that, there's also been seven releases, uh, including one uh, major network upgrade, a hard fork. We have the next one coming up in January. Uh, and, uh, and there's been two security audits since we last were here. Um, we found uh, one uh, critical vulnerability that John's going to talk more about, which got fixed. Uh, there's been a lot of features added, and uh, we learned a lot uh, about how to deploy releases. And we started doing a little bit more formalized planning, a little bit more, uh, as a result, because we kind of were seeing that Sometimes features will kind of pile up as well as we try to make releases. And I think we are doing better for it. Now we're looking for the schedule hard fork, which we cannot move, you know, time-wise. Uh, we have a very kind of clear list of scope, and we know what we're going to cut if we don't make it, and so on. The developer ecosystem has been very active. Uh, there's been a lot of wallet projects. A lot of them are still hanging around. That's great. There's been infrastructure services. Hashtag who was on it before. He's done a payment process for Berlin. Uh, I've contributed to Grimbox, uh, that's an open transaction building protocol. We're listed, I think, on more than 30 exchanges. Uh, and uh, several mining pools are supporting us. <coughs> and I think I've counted about four ASICs being announced, uh, two probably, maybe more, do you think it's more? 
no? uh, uh, two are still in the race as far as I know, maybe more. And there's been uh, five uh, uh, forks. Uh, we're going to hear more about A6 today as well. There's been uh, five uh, kind of uh, forks of the project, which I think is great. It's very flattering. It's, it's some developers find it, it, it really interesting enough to, to fork it. Um, I, I, in general, it's been, it's been a lot of activity. The governance, as uh, Lee Spoon touched upon before, uh, we had our benevolent dictator for life uh, going missing. As a result, the, 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 the council, the core team, uh, who got together because there was somebody, somebody needed to control the motorcycle uh, world that was receiving donation funds. Uh, that really then proposed a new governance situation uh, where we introduced an RFC process, uh, which is basically a formal way, a, a process, a structure for how you submit uh, proposals to make substantial changes in work. Uh, we have five accepted so far. Uh, you know, Four in the oven, kind of looking to be merged anytime soon, and there are four in the draft stage at the moment as well. We also started uh, creating sub teams. Uh, we, we've created kind of three that are very active right now community, who organized the, uh, uh, this uh, Wincon, uh, no sub team, and the wallet sub team. Uh, the idea here is basically you create small, smaller sub teams around specific areas where um, you know, decision areas or matter areas, and you let the people there uh, take decisions that matter for that, that's relevant for that that area to kind of push away and, and distribute uh, decision-making authority across the entire project. Also received uh, two anonymous uh, uh, coin-based donations from 2010, I think, uh, and uh, we now have, as a result, um, uh, 126 uh, Bitcoin in the Green General Fund, which is amazing. Uh, it, we thank you so much to this anonymous donor, uh, donors, we don't know if there's one or two, uh, these, these different uh, donations. I uh, suspect they might be familiar with each other, at least in you know, how close they were from the Coinbase. Uh, this has changed our, our economic position. It's not something we expected in Bitcoin Zero to be in this uh, position now. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, very humbling that we've uh, received this trust and we'll, we'll try to, to do our best with this. Community wise, there's been many chat groups, local events all over the place. Um, we changed our uh, project website. Uh, Tommy uh, was here, he redesigned it, and uh, um, he's going to be talking later. Uh, TM Box uh, uh, opened this conference, uh, or selling lots of green swag. There's a weekly newsletter, 2K readers. By the way, there's like a huge uh, tome of anthology of uh, the Green Noir. Uh, it's finally out. You should go take a look at it over there. There's like this huge uh, uh, cypherpunk uh, uh, book. That, that's worth uh, reading during the break. And there was a, we were on a, a football team shirt, uh, apparently as well. The uh, logo was there. A bit of uh, And then there's also the, we have our, our resident abstract painter, uh, Lovely Green, who uh, I, I let their art uh, speak for themselves. This is just a, a subset of, of art that they have. It's all open source that they post on GitHub. Uh, a couple of ones every week. Uh, it's getting more and more abstract uh, for, for each week. It's amazing. Uh, it's really nice. I, I'm, uh, inspired by the creativity that I see myself. Okay, so that's kind of what happened uh, in, the, in one year. And for me, um, it's quickly easy to forget about that and kind of think that, oh, we haven't made a lot of progress. But if, you, if I look back and think about where we were in Bitcoin Zero and where we are now, uh, I, I'm very impressed of, of all the work that the community has been doing. Questions for the future that I ask myself. How can we onboard more people uh, to the project? And with that, I, I you know, first in general contributors uh, who want to contribute. You know, see something broken on a wiki or whatever, you fix it. Get engaged in the community, help out. Uh, help out with the project management, organizing of uh, Brincon and so on. Researchers, security researchers, uh, cryptography researchers. Quentin is going to be talking about our research problems uh, a bit later. How do we have more engineers on board to the project? How do we make it easier for new developers coming to Green, finding out about Green, what, what is it that they need to learn, what is it that they need to know, uh, and in order to make themselves feel welcome and supportive enough to submit that first pull request. Uh, and, and then, of course, how do we onboard users? But to me, that is a little bit secondary at this stage because we're not quite there yet. And I think what needs to happen in order for us to be able to onboard users easier, easier is to get the others uh, on board with more. We need to have more people working on this project in order for it to be easier for users to use. Great. 
That's my logic, at least. That's my belief. Another question is how we can improve on this governance. Uh, so, so we have this governance structure now. We have a core team that manages these uh, 125 Bitcoin in stage. These, these um, core team members uh, are added by, by their own election, so they elect new people to be added to it. It's not like the community is voting or anything like that. You can't really do that um, because it's hard to do to protect against civil attacks and so on. Um, the council members, including myself, uh, sit for no, like there's no term for how long we sit. Uh, and there's no clear way for how we keep, how we keep other council members out. You know, once you're in, you can't really be kicked out. It's not, it's not straightforward to do it, but we haven't figured out how to do it. Um, so how can we improve on that process? You know, uh, you know what's, the, what's the idea here? What, what should we be doing with the council? Should we just add more members? Uh, you know, just let it grow? Should we add every, every contributor that uh, you know, is starting to contribute our code? Uh, you know, great, we just onboard them into the council. And then if we have 10 contributors, we have a lot of uh, very big council on the side. We don't really know how we can um, reduce membership up, uh, if we need to. So, so how, how do we handle that? How do we eliminate uh, single points of failure? Uh, we had a problem with the website where uh, we lost access to it because it was disappeared. Uh, we had to move the way. Uh, we, we might have a similar problem with, uh, it looks like we're going to have a similar problem with our forum. Uh, 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 how do we eliminate single points of failure is systemic? How do we do it with team members that are crucial to the project? Uh, these kind of things uh, in order to become more resilient. How can we make uh, you know some things more autonomous and kind of have them go on their own and getting more people engaged? And in general, how can we continue to be as transparent as possible with decisions and communication and have a flat structure where everybody is welcome to engage and be part? But now we have the you know the BTC. Uh, you know more money, more problems. How do we how do we spend it? Um, does it work? throwing money at a problem in this space. You see some projects that raise billions of dollars have, have they, has that kind of made them succeed somehow. Um, can, can we just hire? So far, all the contributors, uh, there, there's actually only three people who have been paid, I think, from the fund so far. It's myself, I've got a small stipend, uh, East Bloom, uh, and Miguel. I think that's it. Nobody else has actually submitted a spending proposal. It's not like we turn a spending proposal down or anything, a funding proposal. Uh, but, but, but so far, all of these people started working for free. Uh, and, and started contributing for free and spending a lot of time getting involved in the project. And over time, there was an opportunity or logic for submitting, submitting a funding request, and that was granted. But is that enough? Because we're not seeing a lot of funding requests coming in uh, and, uh, from, from the community. Do we need to change this approach? Should we look at kind of guns for hire and, and put out like uh, you know, postings for how to spend these funds? Is, is that going to work? Is that going to get people to contribute more? Are we going to survive as a, like an open source project that way? Or is everybody going to be expecting to be paid uh, to do work? Because 125 BTC might sound like a lot, but if you look at it like long term, it might not necessarily be enough to pay anybody for, for, for work. It's still really, it's still an open source project. It's got to be, otherwise it's, it's not really going to work. I think we don't have a funding model. You know, we can't just be waiting for, hoping for, uh, for 50 BTC donations every single month. So, so what else can we do as well uh, with the process? We can have bounties, we can have grants, uh, you know, community funding models, uh, budgets for the sub-teams. They can say, all right, this year we're going to spend uh, you know, this amount of money. Please grant this budget in advance. Send it to our multi-sig wallet. And you, you know, we can spend it whichever way we like. Maybe, maybe something like that. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, and, and what's like the spending horizon? We have these funds now. Should we like, look at them all right? We should, we should look, at, look at them for, for the next five years, ten years? Or, or should we look, you know, just spend it as soon as possible and, and just be, be broke again and we can find more money after that? What are the objectives here? Which kind of brings me to another thing. Uh, <clears throat> so we talked about the TLDR of GRID. Uh, uh, so this is this privacy preservation, uh, simplicity, minimalism, uh, scalability, uh, and fairness, which can also be seen as openness and inclusiveness. So we, we, we touch upon these values all the time, but we, we, I don't think we've actually worked out what our like, priorities are in the US to this. Sometimes it feels like we're trying to do this. Okay? And it kind of be, we want, you know, everything is super important, we want to deliver all of these things. But if, 
we do that, uh, there's a lot of trade-offs involved with a lot of directions that you go. And if you're putting equal weights to it, it might be very hard to move forward and make those kind of tough decisions. So having, if we were able to do, you know, like a kind of other type of diagram here, where we decided, you know, actually, so for example, privacy and scalability could be huge trade-offs. Like you can make something very private, but it doesn't scale at all. Or you can make something that scales a lot, and maybe it doesn't do great for privacy as a result. You know, what do we think about that? Which direction should we go? Uh, maybe maybe some, of, some of the things that we do, maybe we can do both, but it also means that we're going to build like a really complicated system. Is that right? Openness, I think, uh, the fairness. So hopefully that should be uh, you know, something that we can value high, but maybe we say, you know what, maybe we should, maybe we should form a company that you know, is, uh, gets all this money and we, we do something else with that, I don't know, I have no idea. But I'm just saying, we need to kind of figure out what's important in this uh, and what's most important. And, and that will allow us to, to be more focused and maybe tackle some of these problems that we're facing and challenges. And, and maybe decide also which of the open research problems that Quentin is talking about, which of them are most important. Which ones are, are the ones that we need to focus on and really find people to work on right now? And which can we say, you know what, we actually don't care about this right now, we care about it maybe later. I, I don't have answers and I, and I kind of, uh, I, I invite us all to think about these things and discuss it as a community and figure, figure it out. And then I have a little wish list for things I, I, I like to see for Green in 2020. Uh, it's part of like kind of thinking about a, a roadmap. Um, and I was thinking about what, what like a team, uh, theme for, for all these uh, you know, ideas and stuff uh, would be. For me, uh, I looked for a term that would suit it, and I found there's like this thing called underpinning, which is you know, trying to strength, strengthen the foundation of, of a building structure. So we have the structure, it's out, it's, it's on mainland, but is it, is it solid enough to really build, build more on top of it, and like more user facing stuff on it? Really, are we really ready for that, and we need to kind of strengthen that uh, core foundation? So, so some of the things I want to see in general, uh, the design priorities that I just talked about include the developer experience. I don't really care about the user experience at this stage, but what is the developer experience? How, how, how easy is it for developers to pick up and build a green wallet? How easy is it for an exchange to integrate into us? Uh, do we have the right documentation? Do we have the right uh, uh, examples, code examples? Uh, do we have the right uh, APIs? We, we, I think we can do a lot of work to improve the developer experience. Maybe we have a lot of this stuff, but let's put them all in one place and let's like make that developer onboarding super easy then. I, I, it, it feels like a, a slam dunk. I want to see more sub teams, hopefully, with, with a lot of strong voices in the community that are not part of the core team. Other people have very strong opinions about things uh, to kind of balance everything out. Look at us and kind of criticize us and scrutinize us and our decisions and the way we, we, we you know, take actions so that we have a more healthy uh, debate so that hopefully we get something more um, solid out of it. G getting maybe a, a funding proposal process together that is a bit standardized makes everybody feel um, they're treated fairly there and, and uh, it's kind of straightforward how you do it because a lot of people might come to the project today and they don't really know how, how they're going to get funding. They might not even know they can get funding. And then by the end of 2020, <clears throat> I think we're going to be running out of hard forks, at least the scheduled ones. So what do we do then? Do we feel like you know, we're being solid enough not to have any hard forks anymore after that? Do we need to change that? Do we need to say, okay, cool, we're going to have like a soft fork, soft fork um, uh, approach? What, what are those uh, strategies and, and how can we define it? And just in general, communicate better and have that better message. It's hard. We're not that many people who are like active day in the project. Development side, Michael's going to talk a bit on the wallet side of his, his ideas here. Uh, these are just my kind of general which points. Transaction building uh, needs to be improved. Uh, maybe trying to find like something that's good enough as a, like a baseline standard to make it easier for, for wallets, uh, wallets to be integrated, for developers to build wallets and so on. Try to prevent accidental use of unsafe practices. HTTP transacting, for example. Make it easier to have light clients. Iterate on, uh, on how we propagate. So 
excuse me, tra transactions, stand line, maybe early, uh, how will we lay transactions on the network? There's a lot of resources coming out that's quite interesting. The P2P network itself, uh, there's been talks uh, during this year where we should be doing I2P on the, on the node uh, level. Uh, we're looking at Tor for the wallet level. Uh, does that make sense? Should we do it? Should we not? Should we encrypt all node traffic? Uh, in, in general, reduce third party dependencies. Yes. Reduce third party dependencies uh, as much as we can. Uh, I, I haven't even looked at it, but I'm just saying it now because it would be nice to do. Less dependencies. Uh, so what, what is the roadmap process in general? How do we, how do we kind of as a community figure out where we're going? So, so some of the community members have posted ideas and proposal on the forum. Uh, I'm going to draft a uh, uh, first RFC, uh, at least, uh, publish it uh, as an open document and invite everybody to get involved and say what they think about it, what should change, what, what could be better, which direction to go in. Uh, it's going to be uh, communicate, communicated on the forum and also on the Green RFC's repo, so if you pay attention to that, we, we might together work on a roadmap document that makes sense. Thank you for me. That was that was all for me, and I'll hand it over to to Michael, who's hiding. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to try and go quickly here. So this is a uh, why you know GUI or uh, the story of the wallet so far. Wallet development. Why you know GUI is a it's a well phrased question. Uh, which we get asked a lot in some form or another, and I'm just going to explain why as part of this. So, what, there's no GUI for the wallet because I'm shit at writing GUIs. And it's not really what the core team strength is, we thought that the best, that it's a much better strategy to focus on the core technology and the tool set to allow others to build on top of the grid. And I think that's uh, not necessarily unique, but it's certainly rare, I think, in crypto projects. So, so the focus here is to focus on core technology, focus on tooling, and also worry about whether this is the right strategy. Um, a couple of months ago I wasn't so sure, but after seeing the number of wallet projects out there, I think I'm feeling a bit better about that these days, and this is the right way to go. So, so here's a quick overview. This is not all the wallets out there that are built on top of, of the, the work we've been doing. So we have Niffler, for instance, so that's using the, the JSON RPC API. Iron Belly is actually using the, the Rust code linked directly into iOS. Wallet 713, also no GUI, shame, shame. But um, it's a much better command line interface so far, at least, than what we have so far in the, the core wallet, which I don't really focus on that much. Um, Diagon Alley is another one. I think that's an Electron wallet. And then Grim Plus Plus, which has a completely, it does its own thing, but again, it's another, it's another approach to how to put a wallet and integrate it all together. So I think we're doing okay on this front. So this is just a, an overview of what I've been doing with myself the past year anyhow. Um, first thing was we split the wallet from the node because it used to be all in one. Uh, second, uh, and this has really been the major focus over the past year, to refine and solidify the APIs so that um, anything you can do in the wallet, you can link in as a developer and do that way, do through the APIs that we have there. So we have um, directly linked Rust APIs, we have JSON RPC APIs. Um, <coughs> There's a, there's a completely pluggable architect, architecture there for some aspects. So right now the, the backend implementation is LNDB. If you wanted to come along and write a, an SQL backend for the wallet for some reason, then you'd be able to. Like there's a very kind of, it's very obvious in the code where that has to be um, added as a, as a sort of plugin. Um, full lifecycle manager, you can create wallets, delete them, uh, change passwords, all that kind of stuff that you couldn't really do um, at launch. And everything you can do in the command line, you can do by the APIs as well. Directly 
this JSON RPC API you can use from Node um, if you prefer doing it that way. Um, you can also, um, I'm not talking about this much, but if you want to link in the Grin Node libraries as well to start up a server and spin it up that way, it can all be done. So really, I think we have a good, a good foundation here for any developer to come along and do kind of a mix and match Node slash Wallet solution that looks a lot better than anything we could produce because it's not really our strength. So as far as upcoming features for the wallet, anyhow, uh, short term, for the 300 hard fork, um, transaction exchange via Tor, which I think I think uh, it works quite well. It's quite a, I mean, it's not, it doesn't do absolutely everything we need, we need to do with, trans, with uh, transaction creation, but it certainly goes a long way. It punches firewalls. It's more secure than using HTTP, for sure. Um, so be sure to have a look at that if you're a developer or interested in this. Um, payment proofs, again, because um, the way we, we, we're now <coughs> exposing wallet listeners to Tor hidden services, but that also gives us an address that's derived from the wallet keychain, which means we now have an address we can use for payment proofs. Um, better state updates. So I think right now the process of, of updating your wallet is kind of manual. You need to run this green wallet check to kind of scan the UTXO set periodically. But this is all integrated now, so if you say you recover a wallet from scratch, it should automatically scan the chain and keep it up to date to make sure it's in sync with what you have in your wallet. And then beyond that, um, really, no, number one is that the code base matured. There have been a lot of changes going in the, over the past year, and it would be nice to kind of let that API sit for a while and give people a chance to, to really start using it. Um, the offline problems, so Tor solves quite a few problems. It doesn't solve all of them, but one of the big ones is uh, the offline transaction problem. How do you transact with someone who's not necessarily listening on the wallet right now? There's a lot of potential solutions for that, but I'm not going to go into detail now. Um, as Daniel was saying, better developer documentation, guides, etc. Um, perhaps a better out of the box command line experience. As I said, I haven't really focused on the grid wallet itself's command line, but others have certainly been problematic with that. And yeah, these are some longer term things that I'd, I'd kind of like to research. Um, BLS signatures, which is, um, <coughs> it looks promising. It's based on kind of immature cryptography pairing Grace Crypto. But um, if it can be applied to Grid Transaction Exchange, and it, it'll, it'll enable much easier, a much easier kind of transaction creation, as well as the possibility of aggregating kernels, which would be a big thing for Green overall. Fly Client, that's another example of a light client that doesn't need the whole chain state to, to sync. Um, and a lot of these ideas would probably be best served, not in a new chain, I'm not saying we're going to start a new Grin, but certainly an experimental chain, which I just call Grin Secure, because you look at the words, like, is that a secure Grin or is it an insecure Grin? I don't know. We don't know either, because it's, it's all based on kind of very immature cryptography. So, um, and, yeah, that's it for, for me for now. So.